Hey there, listeners. It's Amanda Jensen from Riley Children's. Welcome back to the Colorectal Quiz. Today we have a very special episode, episode 24, and it is part three of a three-part series discussing cloaca. Specifically for today, we will pick up talking about operative management. Dr. Frischer, why don't you start us off? All right, welcome back, everyone. Here we are with another episode of the Colorectal Quizzes. I am really excited because we are talking about cloacas again. We are doing another recording, which means we are going to have lots of content and lots of discussion about this condition that challenges us both in and out of the OR. And so I'm really excited. We have some guests with us today. And of course, my partner, Dr. Levitt, will uh, help introduce everyone on the screen today. Dr. Levitt is my dad. I'm, oh. My name is Mark. I get um, called on that at like two times a year. I always mess up. That's okay. Um, <laughs> and he's a very smart neurologist. And by the way, you know, he told me that when I went into surgery, I had chosen a non-cognitive specialty. So take that. Like you said, he's a smart man. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we're back um, and we're continuing our discussion about cloaca. And with us is a cloaca expert and my partner in crime in helping children as well from Columbus, Richard Wood, Nationwide Children's Hospital, with whom I spent many, 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 many hours trying to work out a protocol to make cloaca a little bit less of a mystery. And we're going to try to explain that today uh, because it's a mystery to many surgeons, but I do believe with the proper thought process and proper radiology, it actually can become more of a understandable entity. Richard, thank you for joining us again. Great. Thanks for having me. So I think today we're going to go over a couple of different cases and scenarios. And so Richard, why don't you take us through what you have planned for us? Because I think we're going to discuss sort of shorter segments, longer segments, what to do with the urethra, which I think really makes a lot of us nervous. I know I've seen a number of patients where a lot of surgeons do a great job mobilizing the rectum and putting that in the right place, but it's the urogenital reconstruction that really challenges us. And I think Richard and Mark put together a real great protocol here. And by the way, uh, the fact that you mentioned that, unfortunately, Richard, I know um, you have seen this as well, where a surgeon has managed the rectum and has ignored the urogenital sinus intentionally saying, oh yeah, we'll deal with that later. And that is not ideal. The ideal time is to understand the entire cloacal anatomy and fix it all at once. And the urogenital complex is the complicated part. The rectum is usually the easier part and it ought to all, it ought to all be done together. Mark, that is a great point because I think of many of us is at like these tertiary and coronary centers, the surgeon is capable of moving that rectum, putting it in the right spot and leaves the urogenital sinus and then that's left for the reconstruction surgeon to go and attack that. But now you're going into a reoperative field, which clearly is a more challenging situation. So if we could do it all at one uh, setting, probably a better situation. And I think the other thing to mention is that, you know, the, a lot of these kids are still having issues of vaginal voiding when you've done the urogenital part. And so you haven't really removed that risk of UTIs, which is so damaging for kids with cloaca and, you know, if we look at the long-term outcomes of these children, about 30 to 50% will develop long-term renal dysfunction. So I think from a practical perspective, I agree with you, Jason, it's a much easier approach when you don't have a, you know, a, a scarred field to work in. But I also think there's the, yeah. there's this thought that these kids are taken care of when they're really not. And then their ongoing risk of renal dysfunction is not taken care of either. So I think it's like Mark said, really practical to get a, holistic approach to the malformation and a sort of overarching view on how they should be reconstructed. And then, you know, either it's it's one you can tackle or one you need help with. But uh, I think the benefit of the protocol, which we're going to talk about, is that you don't have to change your plan. I will say just in addition to that, if I, if I may, one of the things about the protocol that I am most proud of is that surgeons can define the anatomy before they decide whether or not to do the case. And I actually have noticed a significant reduction in the need for redos because surgeons are following the protocol, 
understanding the measurements and saying, okay, this is a cloaca that I think I can handle, or this is a cloaca that I think needs to be referred. And I don't think surgeons are diving in to cases that they probably ought not to be doing. And maybe that's why the redo number has gone down. And that's what I think the protocol is probably most valuable for. And then of course, it, of course, of course it has value for the surgeons who are actually gonna do all types of cloaca, knowing what type of cloaca to do. And that's was Richard's point is that the imaging is so good, we now know what to do. And then when we execute, it's exactly what we thought we had to do. And that's a really dramatic change because when I got started in this, you know, as, as Alberto Pena's fellow, I vividly remember that the cloaca would be set up for the day. We would start with a cysto. We didn't do any imaging. And then we basically said, okay, let's go for it. And then we spend the next eight or 10 hours watching artwork play out. And that was just simply not a reproducible way to solve these kids' problems. Thanks, Mark. If we look at the first case, and I'm sorry about the psychedelic pink, but my radiologists got very creative and I thought it was a good one to show. But we have 3D reconstructed imaging here of a patient who's about six months old. And what we can discern from this imaging is a urethral length of 2.2 centimeters. And the cutoff we use in the protocol is 1.5, so a good adequate urethra. And then we can see a common channel length in this patient of 2.5 centimeters. So I would say this would be a fairly classic short common channel cloaca patient. The one caveat I will say, and I'd like to get comments from Mark and Jason is, in this case, we see the rectum is quite high. And I've included a picture on the right, which shows us where the spine is. And so to my eye, I always like to look at the PC line or the line between the pubis and the coccyx. And in this particular case, the rectum looks a little higher than the PC line. And so I think that's the third piece of the puzzle we spoke about in the, in the, in the discussion on the protocol. What's the urethral length? What's the common channel length? And what's the relationship with the rectum to the PC line? So Mark, I don't know if you want to give us some thoughts on, on your ideas here with regard to the rectum. And, yeah. and, and I guess the UG sinus as well. So uh, interestingly, I, uh, our fellow just graduated and was today was my last case with him, Rodrigo Mann, who's on his way to Atlanta, very proud of him, did a phenomenal job. He said, can I just ask you a quick question about cloaca? Can you just give me a quick one line summary of what I need to know from that beautiful paper? This is literally what he asked me about two hours ago. And I said, sure, common, <laughs> common channel, less than three centimeters sets you up for a possible TUM, but you need to have an adequate urethral length and that's 1.5 centimeters or greater. Common channel greater than three centimeters almost always means a urogenital separation, period. And if so, if you know the common channel length and you know the urethral length, you can pretty much make any plan. And he said, thank you and he walked off into the into the distance but um and basically that is 50 years worth of work in this field starting we talked a little bit about the history on the last time starting with hardy hendren and alberto pena and all of that and here we are good radiology common channel three centimeters or less gives you a tum option but you need an adequate urethra because when you pull down the TUM, when you pull down the urogenital complex, you better leave yourself with an adequate length urethra, otherwise that urethra will leak. So with regard to the rectum, I completely agree, Richard, PC line is key. The one thing I will say, as opposed to a male rectum, where you're sort of differentiating the height of the rectum and whether you need to do laparoscopy or whether it's reachable by PSARP, one thing that I have found is if you do a TUM, the rectum comes too. So a high rectum like this might actually be doable posterior sagittally with a good mobilization of, the, of a TUM. Now, you need to sort of get a feel for that and decide before you go, because I don't know if you would have started this laparoscopically to do the rectum, but I might have given this a go posterior sagittally, knowing that the rectum is high, but I think it's probably reachable posterior sagittally 
with the assistance of a TUM? Yeah, Mark, I must be honest and say, like, we, we've done a lot more laparoscopy in our cloacal repairs um, of late. I do think there's really good benefit in releasing the rectum from above. I mean, you obviously, having done lots of this, will know that those lateral attachments posteriorly on the vagina where the blood supply lies is like such an important safe plane to be able to get to and to get a good release of the TUM. And I think with a high rectum like this, it's not always that easy. And we're talking here practically for people who maybe haven't done hundreds of these to to see that attachment blood supply piece. And I think an important point to make is that you have to really go into the peritoneum with these releases because you, you've got to get the rectum out the way to be able to mobilize the posterior vagina. So my, my preference here would be to be laparoscopic, get the rectum freed up. The one thing I will say in agreement with Mark is I usually don't divide the fistula off the back of the vagina. I just mobilize the rectum. And then when I do the TUM, then you can divide the rectum and, uh, off the vagina and repair it. And the rectum's right there rather than separate it. And then you have to go and try and find it in the pelvis and make sure it's not twisted and all that. So mobilize, but leave it on, and then you can just take it off. But as Mark said, you could do it either way or try TUM first. And if it doesn't reach, you can always mobilize more with laparoscope. That's a very good discussion. And just to give some credit, I know Belinda Dickey in Boston is also doing a fair bit of work on uh, laparoscopic mobilization, even of the um, UG sinus. For completion's sake, Richard, you want to talk a little bit about your experience with the laparoscopy for the UG sinus part? I'm happy to. Do you want me to do it when we do the separation piece? Yes, that's probably wise. Yeah, so okay, so let's uh, let's continue with this case. It meets criteria for a possibility of a TUM. It's less than three centimeters common channel. The urethra is greater than 1.5 centimeters. <clears throat> Richard, you would agree that you would you you would believe prior to surgery that a TUM would be successful. The rectum is another discussion at the moment. We talked through that. Okay, so we're going to go for this from a TUM point of view. Total urogenital mobilization. Correct. Yeah. So right. I think the first step is to expose the, the open the posterior sagittal incision, uh, expose the coccyx, and take that incision all the way through to the common channel. The illustrations we've included are really to make the point that while in the separation we leave the common channel intact, when we do the TUM, we, we open the common channel until you can see where the urethra enters uh, or leaves the common channel. Um, because I think the approach is really different. I know when I was training initially, we used to open the common channel for the separation patients as well, but then you have to reconstruct it. And I think, you know, that recent publication where you showed 97% urethra is intact. I think a lot of that's because we're not opening the common channel and then re-suturing it up and landing up with, with strictures and whatever. So. I, I do think leaving the common channel intact when you're doing a separation makes sense. But for TUM, the plan is to open the common channel widely to expose where the vaginal entry is and where the urethral entry is. I, I think it's a good habit to get into to re-measure everything at that point and make sure that you haven't got things wrong. Because to be honest, at that point, you still haven't reached a point of no return. And if you now find wow, this common channel is actually four centimeters or four and a half centimeters and we mismeasured, you could still do a separation at this point and re the common channel closed. So I, I think that's an important thing to mention. You can re-measure your common channel now because you can measure where the urethra goes off. And, um, and you want to fully mobilize the rectum like we discussed a little bit earlier because by fully mobilizing the rectum until you reach the peritoneum, um, I think what you really see there is the blood supply and the attachments of the back of the vagina. And, and that really allows you to mobilize the vagina adequately posteriorly, which allows it to drop when you do your TUM. So I think, you know, there's a lot of talk now in, in PSAB repairs that you only mobilize the rectum just enough because, you know, there's that work that 
Bristol-Rentalis group done showing that there's some benefit to keeping as much of the rectum as possible. But I think in this case, you really have to mobilize the rectum all the way to the peritoneum. So you can see all those lateral and posterior attachments of the vagina. I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that, Mark. Yeah, and, 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 and of course, remember, yes, I think that was really well said. You're opening the common channel until you can see clearly the urethra and the vaginal opening that often requires opening up into the vagina. Don't worry, you can always close it if you open up too much, but you wanna see the urethral orifice. That's the time to put the Foley catheter. That's the time to confirm the common channel length from that urethral orifice to the perineum. As Richard said earlier, our imaging is so good that we've measured it right every time. We've never had that disconcerting feeling that we had the common channel measurement wrong. And then, yes, get the rectum off, full visualization of the TUM, and then we're going to go for the TUM with sutures all around the um, introidal opening and the urethral opening. And remember, the TUM requires that ultimately you will split the common channel down the middle, and the two sides of that common channel become the labia minora, and the urethral orifice goes to the perineum, and that point to the bladder neck is the urethral length, which of course you've pre-measured, and that needs to be at least 1.5 centimeters in order for that not to leak. And that's essentially the TUM, once you fully mobilize the rectum and fully mobilized uh, the urogenital complex. Now, maybe Richard, just go through a couple tricks. I know this is a part that people get a little nervous about, is the suspensory ligaments of the urethra, the anterior dissection for the TUM. How do you find it? When do you know you've done enough? Just give us some of your uh, uh, game day decisions there. Yeah, Mark, I think, first of all, I would say, like any other time in this field, you always work laterally first. And so I think finding the plane as a full thickness plane on the sides is really beneficial. I think sometimes people are nervous and don't do a full thickness dissection. And I think that can get you in a lot of trouble because then the, labor, the, you know, the common channel starts falling apart, which means you don't have good tissue to sew. So you really want to do a full thickness dissection and there's a bloodless plane that you can get into laterally. And then you want to divide the common channel usually what, 0.5 centimeters behind uh, where the clitoral tissue is. So you make sure you don't damage any of the nerve supply of that. And that would be a good landing place for your urethra. And then yeah, if you do a full thickness dissection laterally, and then you come around the corners to the front, you can get into that bloodless plane uh, in front of the urethra. And then, you know, with good tension, um, you're able to expose that plane as you go down. And I think it's important also to keep feeling where the pubis is. So you make sure you get to the bottom of the pubis where the suspensory ligaments start. I know there's been a lot of discussion about partial versus complete TUM, uh, especially in the urological literature. There's never been really any great demonstration that partial TUM is better functionally than full TUM. But I'd say from my perspective, uh, I mobilize enough. I know that sounds silly, but um, I don't think you always have to go to the space of Retzius in order to get an adequate TUM without tension. I think sometimes you can do the lower suspensory ligaments and you're reaching tension free. And I think it's fine at that point to just do a partial TUM. And then in other times you would have to go all the way to the space of Retzius. You see that fat and you know that you're in, in good tissue, and then you'd be tension-free there too. But I don't think I would prescribe that you have to always go to Retzius' space. I think it's you, you go as far as you need to to get a good, a good repair, because I think if you can leave some ligamentous attachments on the front, there's probably some benefit to that. That's excellent. And I think, honestly, anyone who's about to do a TUM should listen to that. I do like the pushing with your finger on the anterior portion of the urethra to feel the little bands and know what to release. Lateral sets you up for the anterior, no question. And I like to see, I really want to go until I see the um, retropubic fat. 
you see a little uh, fatty layer, which you know is covered by a little whitish fascia. And when you incise into the whitish fascia, the TUM releases, it gets nice and free. You gain about two and two, two and a half centimeters at that point. And then you split the common channel as I described before. And then I think it's really important to make sure that the introitus is a good size and fits nicely into the space where you need to place it. And it's not too small and not under any tension. And that's tricky because you got to do maybe some more lateral dissection of the vagina. And then you've marked your anterior limit of the sphincter. So you know how much perineal body you get to have based on how much introitus you want. You don't want the introitus filling the, the perineal body. Sometimes you actually have to close the posterior wall of the vagina a touch to get a nice looking introitus. You wanna keep your eye on the labial fold, the skin fold where it meets in the midline. Then you give yourself a perineal body and then you put in the anoplasty. So Mark, do I interpret then that you would always do a full TUM? Yes, I, I, I want it nice and loose and free and no tension. So yes, I, I've, not, I've not done a partial because I'm worried it's gonna be under some tension. And the blood supply is excellent because you've kept everything intact. And of course you haven't separated the two structures so you won't get a fistula. So um, as long as you're full thickness on the vaginal side, blood supply should not be a problem. So that's a TUM and I think that's pretty reproducible and a well-trained pediatric surgeon with some experience with this should be able to do it. And provided you know in advance from good imaging that you have a TUM, a bowl case, and to repeat, less than three centimeters common channel and a 1.5 or more centimeter urethra at the end once the common channel has been split. That's why it's so important to define the urethral length. All right, so let's keep going and talk about the scenario where you don't have enough urethra or you have a very long common channel. Obviously the two of them go hand in hand. I will say also, by the way, a short common channel almost always has a good length urethra. On occasion, you get a short urethra with a, long, with a low common channel. So those usually go hand in hand, but if you were to do a TUM in a patient with a short urethra, you're gonna have basically the bladder neck is at the perineum and that's a, that's a miserable result. All right, so let's talk about the higher situation. Yeah, so here we have a scenario of a patient again, seven months old, who has had the imaging done, and we see the 3D cloacogram again, and a couple of interesting points here. Number one, the common channel is five centimeters long. Number two, the vagina is five centimeters long. And number three, the urethra is one centimeter long. In addition, you can see that the most posterior structure is actually the vaginas and the rectum actually enters in between the vaginas and the urethra. And that's not actually that uncommon a scenario. You do see it from time to time. And I think it's really where the three-dimensional imaging is incredibly important because it gives you a spatial understanding of what you're seeing. And I mean, we do a lot of these surgeries and... I still look at the 3D cloacogram just before I start the case and I always turn it so it's in prone position and you try and get in your mind's eye like where am I going to find where? I think the other point to make in this case is that the vaginas, because they're the most posterior structure, are often quite stuck to the presacral fascia and that can be more difficult to take down than you might perceive because with the rectum you've got that nice thick wall once you get through that white fascia it delivers very nicely. It doesn't do that quite the same way with the vagina. So just be aware when the vagina is posterior that freeing it up properly is, takes a little bit more work, I would suggest. So in this scenario, as Mark said, we've got a patient who does not have a short common channel. They also have a short urethra. So for my money, this is a separation case every single time. And I think the question you're going to ask now would be, how am I going to start the separation? Am I going to start it from the posterior sagittal position or I'm going to start it through the abdomen? And, and I, know, I know what Mark's going to say because I've had this discussion with him many times. But um, Mark, do you want to give your thoughts and then I can chat a little bit about the other scenarios? Yeah, well, I mean, this, this is the 
there, there is really no debate here that you need to do a separation because there's essentially no urethra. The harder ones, which we don't have an image of, are the borderline cases. But this one, there's no question we need to do a separation. The one thing I really would want to know is an image showing where is the sacrum relative to this spot. And then you already described it very nicely. I'd like to start posterior sagittally no matter what, even if I know that there has to be abdominal work. And the reason why that, unless there's a situation where everything is above the peritoneal reflection, which is exceedingly rare, but does happen. But if I know that the separation of the vagina from the common channel is reachable posterior sagittally, there is, I think, great value in starting that separation. Again, we're doing a UG separation. We've, we're no longer talking about TUM. We put some stitches in the, in the vagina, open the vagina, leave the common channel untouched. Do not open the common channel. Make the uh, meatoplasty just enough to slip a catheter in, maybe one or two millimeters, but do not touch the common channel. Go high, right under the coccyx. Um, you find the bulge, that's the vagina. You put stitches on the vagina and open in the midline. Then you put your stitches along the anterior vag vaginal mucosa. You start your separation. That's the tricky part. The ureters are coming in from the side, so be careful, stay very midline. And do as much as you can comfortably, laterally and midline. And as soon as you feel uncomfortable or it's too high to reach, that's the time where you could have, um, the, could, you could close the vagino urethral fistula. Usually you have enough, enough exposure to do that at that time. We do that with urology. Urology closes it. And I will say another thing we learned fairly recently in our process, Richard, is leaving a little bit of cuff, a little bit of vaginal tissue so they can get a really nice urethra, urethra closure. I think in the past, we didn't get that little nuance. We didn't leave enough tissue and it was a little tight. Now you get a nice closure uh, that gets covered with SIS and a fat pad, but you were asking me specifically about the separation. Then it's time to go into the abdomen. And in my hands at the moment, I would go into the abdomen via a lower midline laparotomy. Laparoscopy may be very appropriate at this juncture for the continued separation and get the vagina to mobilize. And then that's where your decision-making comes in, whether that vagina is going to reach. Um, usually yes, or if the uh, vagina is going to need a replacement to get to the perineum. I, can I bring up a question? Great conversation. I, when I get to that abdominal approach to that separation, get very worried about the ureters and we made very little mention of them. Yeah, Jason, I, I'm pleased you brought that up. I think there are a couple of points uh, I would add to what Mark said. I think we got we got a lot of good information from our scopes. So we knew this kid's urethra was one centimeter above the common channel. So if we can see where the urethral opening is, then we know that the bladder neck lies one centimeter above that hole. And if we've scoped the patient, we know where the ureters are in relationship to the trigone and the and the bladder neck. Many times, these higher common channels, the urethra, the ureters are actually coming quite close to the bladder neck. And so, I think you have to map all that out in your mind when the patient's posterior sagittally. So, you can see the hole. You go one centimeter above, measure it, say, okay, I'm at bladder neck now. My trigone is here. My ureters are there. I think. Once you get within half a centimeter of where your ureters are coming, you really can't do any more safely from below. And if you want to be careful, you could even say, once I hit the bladder neck, I really shouldn't do more than that from below because you've got no way of knowing where the ureters are in the posterior sagittal position. We have tended not to put catheters into the ureters when we've done these separations from above. Uh, with an open case because you have to open the bladder to do that. But of late, we've been doing more where we scope on the day and put in a urethral foley and put in ureter extents prior to starting the case. 
via a cystoscope. And I do feel it gives you a little bit more reassurance, especially if you're going to approach these laparoscopically. It's quite nice to have the ureter extents in because it just gives me a little bit more ureter reassurance. I, I, I fully support the stuff Mark said about if you're going from below. I think the one caveat in this case is that the rectum's anterior. And so there can be some benefit to going in with a laparoscope up front and basically coning down the rectum and taking it off like you would in any other in a rectal malformation male that you do a, a, a laparoscopic or LARP on. And then I think you can see very nicely where the attachments of the vagina are to the back of the urethra and the bladder. Um, I think it's important to try and chase the ure ureters at that point because they are going to come through anteriorly to where the tubes come off. And I think if you're going to do your separation, like Mark said, you want to be really in the midline. I mean, I think Belinda and I have discussed this many times. Most, both of us generally use the scissors just with the laparoscope for the separation because any burning makes us both really nervous. And so you can put some heat on the scissors, but generally you just use um, sharp dissection to do that separation. And you can get you know, a really nice view of doing that. And I will say the other thing is we seem to be doing less vaginal replacements, and Belinda and I have both found this, with doing the laparoscopic dissection, I just think you can see slightly better deeper in the pelvis. The one thing I mentioned in this case was the patient's vagina was five centimeters long. And uh, we wrote a paper several years ago looking at factors that predicted the need for vaginal replacement. And in that, we found the length of the vagina was the most significant predictor, not hydrocolpos or anything else. Unfortunately, there's no like cutoff like 1.5 or 3 for this, but if it's less than 4 centimeters, you're much more likely to do a replacement, and if it's more than 6, you're much less likely. This one's 5. In this case, we did do laparoscopically from above with a separation, and we were able to get the vaginas to reach. Now, I'm sure they probably would have reached with open approach too, but we chose to do it laparoscopically, and we're able to meet our dissection pain from below nicely with the, with the laparoscopy from above, and that, that was how we did it. But I think to your point, Jason, the key to this dissection is you want to really know where the ureters are, so stick in the midline to start with, and once you're through in the midline, you can very carefully work laterally and make sure you can see the ureters so we don't injure them. And then I think the other point that Mark made was when we started doing these upfront uh, separations, we had two patients in the first year that got urethrovaginal fistulas. And that was obviously very frustrating to us. We knew that that was well reported to be 10 to 15% risk, but we then sat down with urology and Mark and myself and the four urologists sat around a table and came up with a strategy of leaving more tissue so they could do a double layer urethral repair like a like you would for any kind of bias flap idea, and then putting a fat pad and SIS on top of that. And I must say, since that meeting, we have not had a urethrovaginal fistula since, and that was five and a half years ago. So I think that change of doing the double layer repair of the urethra, the SIS, which is a single layer SIS, and then the fat pad, those changes have definitely helped. Um, but, I, but I, I just think you need to make sure that that dissection of the bladder neck is done really carefully. And, and the other thing which we try and illustrate is that while when you're separating the rectum off the, off the, you know, the, the bladder when you're doing a male case, the rectum tends to stay in its lane, so to speak. So you can kind of follow it really carefully, like as a tubular structure. Unfortunately, the vagina tends to sort of envelop the bladder neck a little bit. And so it often sort of wraps around it. And you have to be pretty careful when you're doing the separation that you keep working around it and making sure you're not getting into the bladder neck because it's not quite as um, a straight line as you might want uh, as it is in the male patients. By the way, I just want to point out, we um, have there are some really beautiful images that you'll be able to see on the app. And this entire summary 
was really nicely written up. Uh, Richard first authored the paper in seminars in pediatric surgery in December of 2020. And in there are the published uh, artistic diagrams of UG separation in the TUM. And we, Richard and I, went painstakingly through dozens of revisions with the incredible medical illustrator to try to make these points. So I really want you to take a look at those uh, pictures. They're really, really beautiful. We're very proud of them. And one of the things that they do show is this attempt to try to avoid a uh, urethrovaginal fistula. Uh, that was a, a good lesson in, in, in life and of course in medical care. We had a problem. We put about six brains on the problem, sat down at a devoted meeting and came up with a list of things that we were gonna do to try to avoid urethral vaginal fistula. We implemented, everyone on the team agreed, haven't had a fistula since. So, you know, we have to identify our problems. I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. We gotta be honest about them and then we need to work to solve them and come up with a protocol and then respect the protocol. I actually think of those things that you mentioned, probably the most important was giving a little bit of cuff so you can get a really nice urethral repair with good mucosa and no tension. It's probably the most important um, aspect. Anyway, I hope we didn't lose um, you all in the complexity of this discussion. I think the goal was to try to make this particular podcast of interest to anyone who's interested in tackling cloacas to give a sense of understanding of the complexity, particularly of the higher types that will need a urogenital separation, and to give a sense that the TUM is reproducible and to make sure that everyone getting their imaging and making their measurements in advance so that they can uh, make a proper plan. Mark, can so, I make one point about the, the separation piece? Please. Um, I know that there are some folk out there, um, maybe not necessarily in North America, but who are approaching these long common channel cloacas by closing the bladder neck up front because of the fact that the urethral outcomes of these patients have not always been fantastic. And I think one of the points we made recently was to show that if you use this protocol and you repair the urethra without opening the common channel, we were able to have 97% of patients have a catheterizable urethra. And I think one can't underestimate the benefit of having access to the bladder via the perineum, because even if you land up one day doing a metrophenoff or something like that, the fact that you have a pop-off in, in the perineum that allows patients to empty is really valuable to have. And so I think it was good to use the protocol, show the repairs, but then also show that the outcomes were that you could maintain perineal access to the bladder. I mean, we know that not all of these patients are gonna empty their bladders. And like you said, we could maybe talk about it in another talk about you know, who needs clean intermittent catheterization, but having perineal access is important. And so I think this approach really does allow you to maintain that. And I think that is an important goal to have because long-term, many of these children will need bladder management, which is why I think doing these things with urology makes a ton of sense um, so that they are involved from the start. But maintaining perineal access is actually, I think, really important. And so that's why I think stressing this approach to try and maintain that is important. Yeah, I think that's very well said. Um, this has been great. This is really um, uh, a really nice way to summarize a very difficult, a very difficult area of what we do. I, this is clearly, at least for me, the most challenging operation we're asked to do, uh, the most gratifying from an anatomic reconstruction and always keeping your mind on the goal of getting a good functional result. Can we- oh, Well, we have, a, we have a question here from, Kira Ahmad, the uh, new Seattle Children's Fellow, uh, who spent three quality years at Nationwide Children's Hospital as the research fellow and quite the expert herself on colorectal. She usually asks very modestly, I, can I have a question? But usually in the question, it demonstrates that she has the answer already, but let's see what she has to say. 
No, I was just, thank you. I was just gonna say, are we able to re-emphasize why it's not a good idea to go from a TUM, start a TUM and then go to a UG separation and which is why it's so pertinent that we're talking about this algorithm over and over again. Ah, Hira, that is great. We forgot to talk about that. So um, let, me, let me tell you again, we talked a little bit about the history last time and just a quick review for those who didn't catch that podcast, Hardy Hendren would do a UG separation on every patient with a cloaca and then Alberto Pena did the same for years. And then came up with the idea in 1996 to do the total urogenital mobilization, which was beautiful and it saved many patients from that separation. However, I believe then the TUM was applied to too many patients. Um, and some of them ended up with the leakage problem that we talked about if the urethra was not quite long enough, because in those days we were not measuring the urethra. But the other problem is that if you go for a TUM and it doesn't reach, what do you do? Well, then you need to go into the abdomen and continue your dissection of the urogenital mobilization now, on occasion, that's enough, and it does reach. But if it doesn't reach at that point, now you are in some serious trouble because now you have to do the separation. And guess what? You've already dissected the anterior urethra, and therefore you may have a reconstructed urethra now dissected on both sides that unfortunately in a number of cases became ischemic and left the patient with essentially no urethra, and then they have to have a Mitrofenov one day. So Hira points out very importantly that you do not want to go for a TUM that is not gonna succeed. And I think getting this protocol organized in advance, that never happens because you know it's a TUM and it's gonna work, or it's not gonna work. You must go for UG separation up front and preserve the common channel. And Richard can attest that since we started doing these measurements, we never got into a cloaca and said, oh my gosh, this is not what we thought. Every single time we implemented the plan for the case. And that's thanks to good measurements. So here, I thank you for bringing up that very important point that we we neglected, and it's a good example of why you need trainees and fellows around you to keep you at 100%. When you're only able to get 95% and it's not quite enough, Hira comes in and adds 5% and you get an A+. Plus. Thank you, Hira. Um, Jason, do you have a you have a joke for us? Because I, I have a really bad one. If you'd like me to contribute, I'm happy to, but yours are usually better. Well, I think we're going to be in competition today, Mark. This was a great talk first. Richard, awesome work. I think great descriptions, great discussion on pre-operative planning being key in these procedures. So my question to you is, unfortunately, another knock-knock joke. Knock-knock. Who's there? HIPAA. HIPAA who? I can't tell you. Oh, such a good one. <laughs> okay, that's that's pretty bad. And this is probably worse. <laughs> okay, Amanda, who takes care of chickens? Who? A chicken tender. <laughs> <laughs> that requires right, some barbecue sauce. Jeff, that's Jeff, that's Jeff, terrible. Oh Okay. I don't know which one's worse. <laughs> All right there, folks. Uh, that wraps up episode 24, Cloaca Part 3 and Operative Management. Uh, please refer to the articles attached to this podcast in the Stay Current app um, if you're listening uh, with us there. And uh, remember, specifically with operative planning and operative management in Cloaca, that the length of the cloaca common channel is important as well as the urethral length in determining if you're going to be able to do a total urogenital mobilization or if you're going to have to do the urogenital separation 
And again, remember the importance of the SIS in the ischiorectal fat pad to prevent uh, urinal vaginal fistula. Um, please refer again to these articles uh, with any further reading that you may want to dive into. This is Amanda Jensen with Riley Children's. Remember, knowledge should be free. Until next time.